President Biden, we understand, is refusing to give an inch, even as now 34 Democrats in Congress are calling on him to step aside out of, of course, about 200. Biden is in Delaware after being diagnosed with COVID and in a new statement today says he will return to the campaign trail next week. The First Lady Jill Biden is scheduled to host a fundraiser in Paris next Thursday. She's there for the Olympics opening ceremony. The price of admission there is between five $500 and $25,000. Meantime, this afternoon, the vice president, Kamala Harris, met with major Democratic donors, uh, a call, a Zoom call, reportedly organized by the influential mega donor and LinkedIn founder, Reid Hoffman. Hoffman has been pushing very assertively for an alternative ticket, many scenarios which do not even involve Harris. But as Biden digs in, his campaign is dismissing the donors and elected officials who also get money from those same donors who have turned on Biden. Biden's campaign insisting that they have contact with real voters, including the 14 million of them who democratically chose Biden as their nominee, and that the polls that elected members of Congress are now pointing to to justify throwing their ticket out after voters picked it are bunk. In fact, Biden's feelings about polls are not new. Here's what he told me in his most recent interview on CNN. When you talk about the economy, of course, it is by far the most important issue for voters. It's also true right now, Mr. President, that voters by a wide margin trust Trump more on the economy. With less than six months to go to election day, are you worried that you're running out of time to turn that around? We've already turned it around. Look, you look at the, the Michigan survey. For 65% of the American people think they're in good shape economically. They think the nation's not in good shape, but they're personally in good shape. The polling data has been wrong all along. The polling data has been wrong all along. Those are the words of the president, and anyone who's spent any time with him in the past six months has heard that from him. It was a defiant Biden then, as he appears to be tonight, in the face of more Democrats turning on him. MJ Lee is out front from the White House to begin our coverage. And MJ, Biden staying in the race, uh, doubling down tonight, Vice President Kamala Harris getting on that major donor call at a crucial moment. What more are you learning about that call? Yeah, Aaron, at a moment when President Biden is sidelined with COVID and his political future remains so uncertain, we saw the campaign dispatching Vice President Kamala Harris to get on a call with major donors. Uh, it was described as a pep talk of sorts where she said we are going to win. Uh, importantly, she didn't address the chaos that is engulfing the Democratic Party. And clearly, this was seen as an attempt to turn the attention back to Donald Trump. Uh, but Aaron, for all of the talk right now about the growing public calls on President Biden to get out of the race, the campaign's money problems are incredibly serious right now. Uh, many donors have told us that they are simply no longer going to write checks so long mm -hmm. as President Biden remains at the top of the ticket. And I was just speaking with a major Democratic donor who summed it up this way. They said, I don't know how you campaign with a broadening electoral map without money. I don't know what they're doing. I don't know. I've never seen this strategy where you think you can win with without money. Uh, now, Aaron, this donor was saying maybe uh, under the current circumstances, you can dig in for a couple more weeks, but anything longer term is going to be extraordinarily difficult. And they also happen to mention that the emails that you get from the campaign for campaign events and fundraisers have really slowed down uh, in recent weeks. Uh, I should just note, you know, the Biden campaign has really taken pride in pointing to the national infrastructure that it has built over the last year or so, mm -hmm. uh, the offices they've opened, the, the staff hires that they've made, the training that they're doing, the voter outreach. But the bottom line is you can have an amazing operation, but you can't keep the lights on if the money is not coming in. All right, MJ, thank you very much. And joining us now, Isaac Tavere, who has broken numerous stories about the Biden campaign here. Kate Anderson Brower, who's reported extensively on the Biden family, and CNN Newsnight anchor Abby Phillip. Isaac, let me just start with you. Biden insisting he's not going anywhere, campaign insisting he's not going anywhere, campaign chief giving that interview this morning, despite the list of Democrats calling for him to step aside, obviously getting longer by the hour. Do you think these calls are now backfiring or not, Isaac? Well, they're backfiring in a way. And also, it's important, it's been pointed out to me, that Joe Biden is experiencing what's happening in a different time frame than most of the rest of us. He was aware last week that Nancy Pelosi had a tough conversation with him because he was part of it. The rest of us only became aware of it this week with the CNN reporting about it. So he is factoring that stuff in not in a way that is, uh, as some have made it out, that he's just not paying attention to anything. He's paying attention to it. He just thinks that he has a lot of other information and data that's pointing him in a different direction, and also is always coming back to the fact that other people said he couldn't beat Donald Trump. Other people said that Hillary Clinton was the one to beat Donald Trump over him in 2016, and he thinks he's proven that, that his argument's wrong. 
before and he can again. So, Kate, the chaos and uncertainty out there, obviously we know the importance of Jill Biden and the First Lady's supposed to go to Paris, right, for a fundraiser uh, and the, the Olympic opening ceremony, right, as part of her role as First Lady. Price the tickets five hundred to twenty five thousand dollars. I'm curious how actually all that is going. But based on your sources, what is she thinking right now? Well, a source inside the White House told me that she's all in because he's all in and that this caricature of her as a sort of Lady Macbeth character that she's holding on to power and is somehow running things behind the scenes is absolutely not true. Um, she's not involved politically, but she is involved as, as a wife and a support system to him. I mean, they've been married for almost five decades. Yeah. They have been in foxholes together before. Um, she sees this as just another trial that they have to get through. And he's run for president several times. And I think it's really hard for any president to be in there for one term. They, their wives often want them to stick, out, stick it out and try to, to win another term. Well, from a legacy perspective, um, there's no way to go now to say I considered. I mean, it, it's, it's humiliating. Uh, there, there's no way around it if that's what happens. I mean, Abby, at, to that point, Democrats have done a really good job of uh, shooting at their own nominee. A horrible reference. Yeah. I, I shouldn't have used well, those words. But they have been, they have been, that's where the fire has been coming from. How much longer can it go on? Well, if you're one of the Democrats who feels incredibly vulnerable right now, electorally, in terms of the fundraising, you want this to end in the next couple of days. Yeah. Uh, because the clock is ticking to the convention. That's really uh, the time frame that people who want another nominee they think that they have to get this done really in the next week in order to have a shot at a process going into mm. the convention. But if you are Joe Biden, you think you actually need to just hold out until the convention when he becomes, actually not even then, they're going to have a roll call vote that would make him the official nominee uh, in just a matter of a, a few days, actually. And I think Biden sees the timeline very differently. He sees between now and the convention as a relatively short period of time where he can push back on these calls. Uh, but the, for the Democrats who are in these tough races, the Sherrod Browns of the world, they really are putting on the pressure now because really this next week is a crucial window if it's going to be someone else. You have you were talking about um, some of these donors, and it is sort of amazing in conversations I've had with these donors. Yeah. There's almost a glee. There's a power that they've never had before. It's like fantasy football. What ticket do we want in, in groups of very, yeah. very rich people influencing this? You've been reporting on texts that are coming from these donors to people up for re-election yeah. saying, turn on Biden or else we cut it off for you too? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I'm told, I've, I've seen these messages going from donors and bundlers who are talking to donors to candidates and to uh, people who are fundraising on behalf of the candidate committees that are basically saying, we told you weeks ago, Biden needs to be off the ticket. We want someone else. Some of the, the, the messages are even more explicit. We want an open process. We don't want Kamala Harris. And yeah. so that is a, a really... Um, that's an enormous amount of pressure. I'm really not sure we've seen anything quite like that before. I do want to say, Aaron, though, mm -hmm. these are these donors are um, these are people who are dyed in the wool Democrats. They are right. spending enormous amounts of money to back Democratic causes and candidates, and mm -hmm. they don't want to waste their money. But they also believe that because of what they've committed financially, they have influence and they are using that leverage right now. Uh, you know, Isaac, I want to play again this issue. So that this is the influence from donors, right? And then with all of this going on, the move in the polls that we've seen, such that we've seen, uh, is something obviously that Biden dismisses. Let me just play again uh, something that I think very fairly reflects what everyone I've heard who's talked to the president has said is his view on polls. With less than six months to go to election day, are you worried that you're running out of time to turn that around? We've already turned it around. Look, you look at the, the Michigan survey. For 65% of the American people think they're in good shape economically. They think the nation's not in good shape, but they're personally in good shape. The polling data has been wrong all along. You know, um, he, he truly, Isaac, from, I mean, not just from that. I, I have heard him say it before, and anyone, as I said, that I've spoken to has said that he said the same thing. He truly doesn't believe the polls. 
Uh, that's right. And that's not something post-debate. That's where he's always been. Your interview yeah. was at the beginning of May, right? Yeah. Uh, and the, the issue is that the polls in 2020 showed him ahead at this point, and he went on to win. Uh, there are it, There's a lot of questions about polls and the sample groups and all the rest of it. But Biden feels like he has a deeper connection to what's going on, and he feels like there will be a real recoil against Donald Trump, even in the last minutes. Part of that also is calling the bluff in a way with these donors that Abby is talking yeah. about and saying, are you really not going to be there? And importantly, the, you have a lot of Democrats who are really uncomfortable about this. One Democratic member said to me uh, about Abigail Disney, who said that she would boycott giving donations. I don't really want to live in a country where an heiress gets to pick our president. Notably, she and other people who have called for the boycott had not given money to Joe Biden already in this campaign. Hmm. And so the Biden campaign looks at them and says, you weren't with us already. So what's the what, what are you threatening us with? President Biden's campaign is publicly insisting he's not going anywhere. But the calls for him to step aside seem to be growing uh, sometimes by the hour. Do you see this pressure ultimately pushing President Biden to this, to step aside? You know, all rational calculation would say yes, but their posture has been more defiant really from the outset uh, than uh, than you might have expected, given the level of unease in the party. I think if you talk to the political strategists, you know, campaign managers, pollsters, overwhelmingly, they do not believe Biden can recover. I think donors are in the same camp. <laughs> Elected officials were divided, but they are now moving uh, toward that kind of preponderance as well. Wolf, the analogy I often hear from Democrats is pretty striking. You know, more than one person has said to me some version of when you are in a car that is speeding toward a cliff, it is unquestionably risky to jump out of the doors while it's still moving. But it's probably riskier to stay in the car as it goes over the cliff. And that, I think, is the dominant view among Democrats. It's not easy to switch, but what they are doing is not on a trajectory to succeed. Bill de Blasio, the former New York City mayor, is also joining us Mayor, uh, sources are telling CNN that former Speaker Nancy Pelosi actually played a role in Congresswoman Lofgren's call for Biden to step aside. Another source described the president as being, quote, a seething, seething at Nancy Pelosi right now. How remarkable do you think all of this is? Oh, it's unprecedented, Wolf. But I would just like to say Nancy Pelosi is such a towering figure in our party and one of the most pragmatic get things done leaders we've ever seen in the history of the Democratic Party. And so it does not surprise me, even if she's being careful about it publicly, if she believes that, to use Ron's example, we're in that car about to go off the cliff, it would not be in the nature of Nancy Pelosi to stand back and watch the car crash. Uh, I think what we have to think about as well is what's happening on the ground, uh, all the volunteers, all the supporters, especially in those swing states, you know, right now, I think there's a pervasive feeling in the party that we're not going to win. And there's going to be a lot of energy for the idea of let's do something different. And I would add not just about who our candidates are. We also need to get a message because right now uh, our message is primarily, you know, we're not Donald Trump. And to some extent, we're fighting for uh, a woman's right to choose. But we're not really presenting the American people with a bigger positive vision of where we want to go. So there's a lot of things to fix, and I think there's tremendous energy on the ground to like be given an equation that we can win with. S.E. Cup, uh, the uh, current House Democratic leader, Hakeem Jeffries, is also not discouraging members from continuing to speak out against President Biden's candidacy. So mm -hmm. should we expect to see even more defections coming up in the coming days? And can President Biden actually overcome all of this? Uh, that's what I'm hearing from Democrats when I talk to them. Um, you mentioned Zoe Lofgren's letter. It was devastating. I thought um, Seth Moulton, another congressman from Massachusetts, wrote an op-ed in the Boston Globe today talking about how the last time he saw Joe Biden, he didn't recognize him. Um, that was also pretty brutal. I mean, these are not good stories for Joe Biden's campaign. I was watching CNN earlier and our, our Brianna Keeler did a, a great interview with a great Biden surrogate, a congressman. But he had to sit there defending really bad poll numbers, Democratic uh, leadership concerns, Democratic voter concerns, Democratic donor concerns. Is this really the news cycle that Democrats want to live in perpetually in this state of total inertia while Republicans are just building momentum after momentum after momentum and waging a very, a very serious campaign, a campaign that's designed 
to win. Um, I hope Biden gets the message from these Democrats that increasingly this campaign is looking like a vanity project. Eva McKend, uh, you've been actually traveling and covering Vice President Kamala Harris. Uh, we're just learning she actually gave a pep talk to donors today, but didn't address questions about President Biden's candidacy. What does that say to you about the delicate position she's in right now? You know, Wolf, I think it illustrates that she's really a disciplined messenger. She is narrowly focused on outlining the stakes of this election. I was with her during her last six campaign stops across the country. And her last uh, stop, for instance, in uh, Michigan, she was joined by two former Republican women talking about reproductive rights. She often talks about Project 2025, so much so that you have Democratic voters showing up to these events, talking about how they are afraid of Project 2025 and the policy implications of a second Trump presidency. So I think that this sort of relentless focus on the issues, uh, staying narrowly focused on the, ta on the task at hand, is sort of the goal here in order to refocus this conversation. She see, seems to see very little upside to trying to weaken an already weakened President Wolf. Interesting. Uh, Ron, uh, is the Trump campaign actually ready for a possible change in the Democratic ticket? And how much of their current strategy is centered on President Biden being their foil? Yeah, look, I mean, I think they feel very confident about their prospects against President Biden at this point, you know, in part because the race has been so static and the movement has, to the extent there has been, has been in Trump's direction. Plus, Biden's, uh, you know, problems, 40 percent approval rating, 70 percent saying he's too old, have been there for a very long time. I mean, he has had the airwaves to himself in all of the swing states for almost all of this year. And his job approval rating and polling that's been out in the last couple of days is no higher in them than it is nationally, despite all of that money. I think they tried to focus on Harris, uh, you know, some at the convention, but in both parties, I think there's a recognition that Harris just shakes up the deck. You know, her floor might be lower. She wasn't a great candidate in 2020. Uh, it might not work out, but her ceiling almost certainly could be higher, particularly with a vice president that generates some excitement, Gretchen Whitmer, Josh Shapiro, Mark Kelly. I think Democrats, as, as the mayor said, would feel a real burst of energy not having to defend this difficult situation they're in. I want to go back to Bill de Blasio, uh, Mayor de Blasio. How do you think Trump's speech last night at the Republican convention in Milwaukee and his position in this race right now is actually impacting President Biden's thinking on whether he should stay or leave the race? Look, I, I want to believe that President Biden and the people around him are, are objective and they're looking at facts, even though it's a very difficult and painful decision and a lot of emotion. There's a lot of facts to look at here. And, and by the way, the, I don't agree with the Republicans, but they did manage their convention very well and they got a message across. Now, I think your question about the speech, I would say the, the beginning of the speech was exactly what Donald Trump should be doing more if he wanted to try and bring in those swing voters, particularly those suburban women voters who really will decide this election. But he couldn't help himself. You know, after six or seven minutes of trying to be a, a unifier, his better angels flew away and he went back to an uh, hour and a half of complaint and rambling, negative, nasty complaints. So I think the, the challenge here for Trump is that he really can't get away from that essential persona. If you're Joe Biden watching that, I'm sure it's tempting to say, hey, we can regain a foothold. But in the end, uh, I go back to the point that I think all of those Democrats, all those folks out there who want to win desperately need to believe we can win and they don't see it right now. And if they were given a little hope and a little possibility of winning, I think it creates a tremendous groundswell of energy that puts us right back in this game. Pushing back while trying to be pushed out. I'm Brianna Keeler alongside Boris Sanchez here in Washington. And today, a growing number of Democrats are calling for President Biden to drop his reelection bid. The total is now over 30. It has gone up from the beginning of our show, in fact. And we are learning that House Democratic leader Hakeem Jeffries and his team are not discouraging members from continuing to speak out against Joe Biden's candidacy. Yeah, but it appears his campaign is not listening to doubters. We're told that Vice President Kamala Harris will join a call with donors this afternoon. This is actually video uh, from a short time ago where she was visiting an ice cream shop in Washington, D.C. with her nieces. This all comes not long after President Biden released his own statement saying he's looking forward 
to getting back on the campaign trail next week once he recovers from COVID. Let's bring in CNN senior White House correspondent MJ Lee, because MJ, you have some new reporting on how the Biden campaign is now trying to rally the troops. Walk us through it. Yeah, I mean, we're told that there was an all campaign staff call uh, earlier today. Those happen with some regularity, so that's not unusual. But uh, campaign chair uh, Jen O'Malley Dillon said on this call uh, that they are focused on voter contact right now. Obviously, the president has made clear that he's staying in the race and the campaign is really telling their staff what we are doing is reaching out to voters. Uh, she said at one point, when you give me polls, I'm going to give you direct voter contact. I'm also told that she he said people in our country are not watching cable news uh, just on the voter contact part. The reason that this is significant is because this is sort of the central argument that we are starting to see from the campaign on the reason for the president staying in. They're essentially saying what is more important to us right now than what the polls are telling us is what the voters are telling us. And O'Malley Dillon did talk about this a little bit uh, on the air earlier today. Take a listen. We go out and we're door knocking just this week. So this isn't in the past, this is this week. Did about 100,000 door knocks. 76% of those people we knocked on doors and we talked to are with Joe Biden. We have about 16% or so that's undecided. They have questions, you know, is, is he in this race? Uh, what's gonna happen? Uh, and then a small percentage that uh, are not available to us. Yeah, so this uh, argument that they are just going to be listening to voters, I mean, that is going to be so central as the campaign continues getting more and more pushback uh, from members saying he needs to drop out. I think it's not a coincidence that we've heard the president himself repeatedly saying uh, since the debate, I can't just discount the millions of people that participated in the process and voted for me. I think the problem is that, you know, who else is listening to voters? are members of Congress. They're going home and hearing from a lot of people that are concerned and think that the president needs to get out. Yeah, they're also noting that people cast those ballots before the debate. Uh, yeah, so that's, that's something true. else. Uh, MJ, thank you so much. Joining us now, we have Ron Brownstein, CNN senior political analyst and senior editor for The Atlantic, and Chuck Rocha, Democratic strategist and former senior advisor to Bernie Sanders and 2016 and uh, Bernie Sanders' 2016 and 2020 presidential campaigns. All right, Chuck, uh, tell us this yeah. moment that we are at right now in this race, how would you describe where we're at on the Democratic side of things? I'd say control chaos. I think that there's trying to be control with the party. Now, I've run a presidential campaign. I'm one of the few people who has. And what you saw Jen O'Malley doing is trying to get a handle on it. When you talk about having an all-staff call, those don't happen all the time, but they happen at times of, of tragedy. I was running a presidential campaign when a guy had a heart attack one time in Nevada. I was in the office, Bernie's office, when that went down. We had to control things and get control over emotions, and that's what you see now. The hardest part of this is what you're reporting on now is all these members of Congress, though. People that he's worked with, he's an animal of the Senate. Like, this is really hard when you start hearing rumors about Nancy Pelosi, but right now the campaign wants to control this and keep people focused on thousands of doors that they're knocking, the infrastructure that they're built, their fundraising. This is where they want to, you talking about. Yeah, they're, they're certainly focused on that when they try to justify him staying in the race compared to some of the polling and, and some of these concerns from lawmakers. Uh, I'm wondering what you make of the sort of discrepancy in some of the reporting where we're hearing the campaign publicly say he's staying in, he's not getting out, and yet privately from sources close to the president, he's asking questions about whether the folks around him believe that Kamala Harris would be a better candidate to be Donald Trump. I think part of that is folks that you get to see on camera that are actually speaking and putting their name and their faces to things and then folks who are being unnamed sources. I'll tell you this about presidential campaigns. There's only a small group of people. Everybody likes to claim that they know about running campaigns, but they ain't never really run a campaign mm -hmm. or been in the room, as they say in Hamilton, where it happens. There's only a small group of people actually talking to the president and the ones that you're seeing are the ones you see on TV while there's other folks who are unnamed. Ron, what are you listening to? I mean, let's just point out Biden ally Senator Chris Coons is saying that he thinks he believes Biden is weighing who the best candidate is to beat Trump. You have Hakeem Jeffries, the leader of Democrats in the House, skirting questions of whether Biden's the strongest candidate and not discouraging his uh, caucus members from saying they think Biden should step aside. And you also have Congressman Steph Seth Moulton writing an op-ed for the Boston Globe saying that for the first time at Normandy, Biden did not recognize, seem to recognize who he was. Yeah. Uh, what, are, what data points are you looking at? 
Look, I think the, as Chuck puts it, the people who have been in the room at the senior levels of Democratic presidential campaigns, I've talked to almost all of them in the last two weeks. Overwhelmingly, they do not believe that Joe Biden can recover to win. I think donors overwhelmingly do not believe that he can recover to win. And that has a real bite on, uh, you know, self-fulfilling prophecy to some extent. Um, uh, and I think elected officials who were very hesitant to challenge him publicly because they have great respect for Biden. And the phrase I heard a week ago often was we have to give him the grace and the space to do this. They are growing more and more impatient. I mean, you know, if, if you look at the at the alternative, which is most likely rallying around Vice President Kamala Harris, I think Democrats believe she may have a lower floor, but she almost certainly has a higher ceiling. You know that with Biden, you are kind of locked in concrete at this point. With the president's approval rating has been stuck at 40 percent or below since the summer of 23, 70 percent saying he's too old. Most people who have been in the room, to use Chuck's phrase, do not believe you can recover from that, despite all the resistance to Trump. And with Harris. Might go badly, but at least there's more fluidity in the situation and the opportunity to re re reignite some excitement in the Democratic coalition. Uh, I want to go back to Chuck because there is this question of what happens if Biden decides that he's stepping out of the race. And just before we, we went on air, you were sort of describing the scenario at the convention. I'm wondering if you could share that with our viewers and, and then sort of give us your perspective on how it works out with candidate dynamics who could wind up at the top of the ticket i've been to every convention since 1996 when i still had hair and was skinny a long time have i seen these conventions and what i'm getting at there is that every convention is the same and you see all those great signs like you saw at the republican convention and the delegates literally get to nominate who they are but there is a provision as you both know and have reported on where you don't have to be with who's with you in case something like this happens which opens up the floor for nominations like they used to do in the old days in smoke filled back rooms when the party actually decided who the nominee would be and so that's what you would see if big if right. somebody didn't run and if the president didn't run they would have to open up that nomination and lots of folks i think lots of people would get into the race and i think lots of people right now trying to position himself through unnamed sources and other things to be on the top of those tickets. What, Ron, what would that look like in this race if you yep. saw that happening? And also, can you speak to something that we've heard some Democrats who are standing behind Biden say, which is once you get into that chaos with the money that's been raised, you could see legal challenges from Republicans and then it's a who knows what's going to happen. Yeah, you know, Brianna, the analogy I often hear from top Democratic strategists is that if you are in a car that is speeding toward a cliff, there is a risk of jumping out of the door while the car is still moving. There's probably a bigger risk of staying in the car as it goes over the cliff, Thelma and Louise notwithstanding. Um, and I think that's what Democrats view. I mean, there are obviously lots of problems with switching at this late date, but you know, I think by and large Democrats feel that it would be relatively seamless in terms of the, the money and the organizational structure to move from Biden to Harris, and I am less sure than Chuck that there would be a full-throated uh, process. I think that, you know, obviously it, it would be open technically, but the candidates who a large number of delegates might think would be a stronger option than Harris, uh, Gretchen Whitmer, uh, Gavin Newsom, have already said they would not challenge her. And I question whether anyone, uh, you know, who is a full-scale top-tier challenger would want to uh, you know, put their uh, hat in the ring against the first female vice president of color at this moment. I, I think the party could coalesce around her pretty quickly and there could be excitement for a ticket that would either be Harris Shapiro, Josh Shapiro, the governor of Pennsylvania, or Harris Whitmer, uh, the governor of Michigan, uh, who would be a real roll of the dice and, and, and potentially a lot of excitement as the first all-female ticket. So I actually think if Biden steps aside, there would not be anything approaching civil war. I think uh, climbing that first mountain of nudging him out. I'm not sure how many people have the, the stomach for the climbing a second mountain of bypassing her. And the party, I think, would feel, by and large, a sense of relief. Not everybody. There are a lot of people who want to stick with Biden. But I think that the, the consensus in the party is clearly moving toward the position that he cannot win. And therefore, if we want to save not only him, but potentially, last point, eight Democratic Senate seats in states where he is now trailing, that could be a deficit that could last in the Senate all the way to 2030, which would leave Republicans plenty of time to confirm uh, successors to Alito and Thomas and thus control the Supreme Court until 2050. President has campaigned their defiant in insisting he's going to be remaining 
the Democratic presidential nominee in this race. But more and more Democrats, congressional Democrats, 10, 10 today alone, are coming out saying he should drop out. Where does that leave the Democratic Party right now? In a state of paralysis, uh, really where it's been for uh, much of the last 22 days. But it's a deeper sense, I think. I mean, uh, there's been movement this week uh, in terms of uh, a selected number of uh, members of Congress, as MJ was saying there, giving different messages for why they believe the president should step aside. Everyone is respectful. Everyone is saying that the choice should be his. But the tone has changed in these letters uh, pretty significantly from Zoe Lofgren, for example, Seth Moulton, for example, using very personal uh, reasons and arguments. So I think overall the party is at uh, one month from its convention period. We've just obviously got back from a Milwaukee, the Republican convention. Democrats are uh, going into their convention completely divided over the idea of who should be the uh, standard bearer, which is something that I think none of us would have uh, anticipated a while back. So uh, also today, the uh, Convention Rules Committee, it sounds arcane, but important because they decide the timing of the nominating votes. So they had their first meeting. They'll have another meeting on Sunday. Uh, the voting will not start till August 1st, but it has to be done before August 7th. So that is the window here. And speaking to a Democratic governor just uh, yesterday who relayed this conversation, uh, he said time is running short. And I think that is clear. However, it's President Biden's decision. The frustration is clear. The campaign is trying to go forward. But the one thing the campaign is really not uh, breaking through is talking about the guy who was uh, nominated last night. That's Donald Trump. Yeah, we're going to be speaking to Congresswoman Zoe Lofgren this hour. We'll right. get her thoughts on what's going on. Kate Bedingfield, I'm anxious to get your thoughts right now. These lawmakers, these Democratic lawmakers, are saying they will support President Biden if he is eventually the nominee and he's running. But given the very deep concerns right now that are being expressed publicly, the deep divisions within the Democratic Party about his candidacy, uh, how tenable is that really if, if he's the nominee? Well, look, I think if he's the nominee, yes, I believe these Democratic members of Congress are going to support him. They all want to see Donald Trump defeated. I mean, I think that's one important thing to remember about all of the anxiety and the uh, emotion around all of this. This is born out of a, a desire to defeat Donald Trump and an effort to put forward the candidate that Democrats believe can beat Donald Trump. So I think, you know, if Joe Biden is the nominee, I imagine that these Democrats are going to, uh, to come home and support him. Uh, you know, I think that one of the things that the Biden campaign has been arguing, kind of their theory of the case here, is that the contrast between Trump and Biden, once we get this conversation back to a discussion of, of Trump versus Biden, uh, you know, that ultimately that's going to bring home not just these members of Congress, obviously, but voters who find Trump to be untenable. And I think what we saw from Trump last night at the convention kind of helped underscore that case. I mean, we heard that he was going to be a unifier, that he was going to be the new Trump. And instead, we got, a, you know, a rambling 90 minute grievance parade that we know is off putting to the swing voters who are going to decide this election. So. For the Biden campaign, what they want to do is bring this back to a conversation of Biden versus Trump. And what all of this churn and concern about him being the nominee is, is doing is having the effect of not narrowing in that choice. And that's part of why they're struggling right now. Actually, Etienne, I know you've worked for both President Biden and for the former speaker, Nancy Pelosi. What's your reaction to President Biden reportedly seething uh, as he hears these calls for him to drop out? Uh, and uh, the role, presumably, that Nancy Pelosi may be playing behind the scenes. Well, I can tell you a couple of things. One is Nancy Pelosi always plays five-dimensional chess. So it's never an easy explanation in terms of what she's doing. But I think Kate makes an excellent point, um, you know, that it's the question now is how does the Biden campaign get on better footing? I think there was a mistake, again, about Speaker Pelosi. She's an institutionalist. She loves the House. I think it was a mistake for the president to send a letter and not go up to the House. I think he's still got an opportunity next week. Next week's going to be an important week. You can imagine they're anticipating more defections. Reporters are going to be pressuring these members. Do you support? Do you not support? I think the president needs to go up there. And if not him, it needs to be the vice president. They need to go up there, bring that Detroit energy, 
you know, and make the case directly to the caucus. Listen, I'm in it. You raised the question. I answered your question. There shouldn't be any more doubt whether or not I'm prepared. We've got to center and focus our attention now, our ire on Donald Trump. He only he can deliver that that message and he can't do it via letter. And I think what Pelosi's trying to really do to some degree is pressure him to rise to the occasion. Yeah, that's good advice from you, Ashley. Thanks very much. Brad Todd is with us as well. The Trump campaign, Brad, is not exactly hiding that they would prefer to run against President Biden. Uh, if, uh, if he were to step aside, how much would that shake up the entire 2024 race? <laughs> Well, I think, first off, it's, if he steps aside, it's most likely Kamala Harris, and she's going to own every bit of the policy that got this administration to a 38 percent approval rating. Uh, and if it's not Kamala Harris, it's the next not most likely nominee is still Joe Biden. That's what we have to accept. And so I think you're going to see this is a challenger campaign, and a challenger campaign in a wrong track year is going to run on do you want to keep doing what they're doing. Jeff, you have some new reporting, important new reporting about a, don a donor call that Vice President Kamala Harris uh, joined in on today and these ongoing concerns about President Biden's candidacy. What are you learning? Yeah, this was not a fundraising call. This was a call with donors to sort of alleviate uh, concerns, we're told. And that is one of the big uh, also worries. There's uh, several issues and worries and fears, but uh, money is a big part. The Biden campaign has built a very robust organization. We've talked a lot about the offices that they've opened and the ads that they've been running. So it takes a lot of money. Donors are, quite frankly, uh, either angry, uh, worried, freaked out, etc. So she was on a phone call, I'm told, with uh, some high-tech donors and things, trying to um, ease their concern, but also specifically, as Kate was talking about, trying to turn the conversation back to a Donald a, a Trump. But she also said, excuse me, let me look at my notes here. Someone who was on the call uh, sent this to us. And it, and it talked specifically about the speech last night. And it said throughout their convention, they had been trying to act like they were trying to bring the country together. But here's the thing. If you claim to stand for unity, you need to do more than use that word. And then she goes on to say, the vice president goes on to say, let me be clear, Trump's convention this week was one big attempt to distract people. But she left people with the idea. And she said, I feel strongly you should all take this with you when you leave. Tell your friends we will win this election. We're going to win. One thing she didn't address, I'm told, was sort of the state of uh, the president's decision making. She is likely uh, not any more read it on that you know, than what he said publicly. He's in this campaign, so she is doing her day job, and that's to be the loyal vice president. You know, it's interesting, Kate, uh, Vice President uh, Harris, uh, she, she went out today uh, and went to an ice cream shop here in Washington, D.C. We've been showing video of that throughout the day. Uh, this seems to be some of Biden's playbook, if you will. He likes to go <laughs> have a little ice cream himself. What do you make of that? Well, look, I, Vice President Harris has been a both a critical governing partner for President Biden in the White House, but also a really active presence on the campaign trail. I mean, she's been carrying forth one of the most significant lines of attack that Democrats have this election cycle on Donald Trump and the Republicans, which is their attack on reproductive health and on uh, you know women's freedom and their right to make their own health care decisions with their doctors. And Vice President Harris has been the really the standard bearer in carrying that message forward. So I don't see that. I don't see her doing this event today as anything different. Now, there may be a little more media coverage on what she's been doing of late because of this story. But I think if you look at her campaign appearances, she's been out consistently as a, a huge factor in this campaign, and she'll continue to be. It's interesting, you know, Ashley, because uh, the vice president is actually, in some of these more recent polls in some of the key battleground states, polling better Absolutely. than President Biden is right now. Uh, and he said this week, this is what Biden said, she would be a great president. So why do you think he's so reluctant to step off the stage right now and give it to her? I think he thinks that uh, he's equipped to do this job and he's prepared to do this job. That's why he's not stepping off the stage. And I think, as he said, I take him at his word that he's best positioned to beat Donald Trump. And to some degree, that is absolutely true. To your point, the vice president is doing well with that broad coalition that Biden built in 2020 to win. But many of her numbers aren't tested. I can look, you can look at Joe Biden's numbers, and if he's at 43, you can trust that that's 43 because her numbers have not suffered under the weight of millions of dollars of Republican attacks. They've just now started to attack her. So to some degree, I think the president is absolutely right. She, she and any other alternative is untested. 